Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, member of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod on this 16th Sunday after Trinity. And our theme for today is God's Intended Consequences. And we begin with our first hymn, hymn number 26. Have mercy upon us, 
and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he giveth the power to become the sons of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all.
we pray that your grace may always go before and follow after us. That we may be continue, but we may continually give to all good works through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, Jesus. 
Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain shows that suffering and agony of the human heart comes to both believers and unbelievers alike. When the Lord saw the widow of Nain, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Don't cry. And to the dead man, he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And he gave him back to his mother. It teaches us to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all our knowledge. The Lord hears our every sigh. He feels our every sorrow. He knows our pains so that he can comfort us. We know and believe this, His grace will always go before and follow after us. The Holy Gospel is written in the seventh chapter of St. Luke, reading verses 11 through 17. Please rise for the reading.
And when the chief shepherd appears, may we receive a crown of glory. Amen. Our text is written in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, reading verses 6 through 11. We read as follows in Jesus' name. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, to him be the glory and dominion. sanctify us by your truth. Your word is true. Amen. Actions often have unintended consequences. This is especially true in big, important actions, like when we removed all the pews and didn't get them back, all of you sat in the front. And I can see your faces so clearly. In his book, The Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition, author Daniel Oakland tells an interesting story how prohibition, intended to rid the country of the scourge of alcoholism, but never came close to fulfilling that goal. What it did do was usher in a host of huge changes that none of the supporters of prohibition ever envisioned. Prohibition gave us income tax, the mafia, plea bargaining, the city of Las Vegas, the sport of NASCAR, the right of privacy, and even even the evil Roe versus Wade killing of babies. Talk about unintended consequences. It makes a person feel kind of nervous about some of the sweeping changes being enacted by our current government, our schools, and our colleges. So is it possible to make plans for the future? get the intended consequences and none of the unintended ones? It might seem possible, especially at those who promote them, but it's not. <laughs> For Christians, however, the results are guaranteed. If you've been perplexed by suffering in your life lately, if you have felt like the devil is assaulting you with temptations, if your life has been generally unsettled and you need some stabilizing, then today's text will be a big encouragement for you. Our theme today is God's <coughs> intended consequences. First, we are to humble ourselves, and God will exalt us. Second, Resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. And third, endure the suffering, and God will establish you. In Christ Jesus, who has proclaimed, I will never leave you or forsake you, dear fellow redeemed. As we look at the final sermon on 1 Peter, I know you're giving a sigh of relief, but our text begins with the word, therefore. A seminary professor once said, if you see the word therefore, you better find out what it's there for. Peter is referring 
referring back to the previous verse, which we read last week, where he had been talking about persecution and suffering that Christians were going through at that time, and which was about to even get worse. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange things were happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you are partaking in Christ's suffering. The believers here were headed for a period of marked suffering, and they should expect it and not be surprised by it, because God would get them through. The Lord, as always, would provide. Therefore, since you already know what's going to happen, then what kind of attitudes should we take? Peter first points out one obvious and simple thing that we can do, which will always have intended and beneficial consequences. Humble yourself. And God will exalt you. And there's no question, do this, and that will happen. Verse 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you in due time. Now, I hardly need to mention that this runs exactly against common philosophy of our time. Humility does not rank high on Americans' life or list of desirable qualities. Rather today, society teaches us to be proud, assertive, stand up for our rights and demand what's coming to us. If injured or suffering has come to your life, you don't need to take it. You need to hire a lawyer and make somebody pay for it. The consequences of our country from this attitude of high, uh, this attitude is certainly unintended. We have become a nation of victims. And with only 5% of the world's population, we have over 80% of the world's lawyers. Now let me ask you this. Can you always say that you have adopted the appropriate attitude of humility in your life? I certainly can't, and frequently feel the effects of guilt of my own pride. But one person who suffered greatly had no spiritual pride was our Lord Jesus, as Philippians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, who being found in the appearance as a man humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly consulted him. Peter urges us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. He urges us to say, Thy will be done. And then to recognize, with the appropriate sense of humility, that the Lord knows what he is doing in our lives. Next, verse 7, which has confronted believers for centuries. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The word casting is the same word used on Palm Sunday when the disciples were casting their garments on the back of donkeys on which Jesus rode into Jerusalem. What a graphic picture for us. Everything you've got that gives you sorrow in life, cast it on the Lord. <coughs> this is not a suggestion here, this is a command. Is there trouble in your marriage? Cast it on the Lord. Anxiety about how you're going to pay your bills? Cast it on the Lord. Guilt over sins you committed? Cast it on the Lord. As the psalmist in Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. 
Brothers and sisters of Christ, unload your burdens. Don't try to proudly carry them yourselves, but humble yourself under God's hand, and He will flee, uh, and He will, and He will flee from you. Or He will never permit your righteousness to be moved. Um, the second action Peter mentions here will define having beneficial intended consequences in your life is to resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8 and 9 then reads, be sober, be vigilant. The apostle saw, Paul says, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Have any of you ever heard a lion roar? For real. Not on TV. Male lions can roar at 150 decibels. Approximately as loud as a jet engine. <laughs> and you can hear lions roar from six miles away. And people familiar with Africa say it can be one of the most terrifying sounds that you will ever hear. So, why does the Holy Spirit choose this expression in particular here in our text? Because our adversary, the devil, is not to be taken lightly. We'd be fools to take him lightly. Here Peter tells us what his intended consequences are. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking victims that he can gulp down we know that experience too well, don't we? When we feel the devil's temptation, and yet very often when we see the devil coming, we do nothing. We stand there like a deer in the headlights. We feel the temptation to sin, knowing the devil is attacking us, and yet we do nothing to resist him. In fact, don't we sometimes even go halfway to meet him, especially in our minds? Yes, we are. Every, we are all guilty of that sin. And by the way, the word adversary is a very interesting word because it means accuser. The one who speaks against us. And that's the main thing the devil does to us Christians. He speaks against us. He whispers in your ear, Remember those sins, sins you committed and you call yourself a Christian? You will never make it to heaven, not with those things you've done. Other people maybe, but not you. And he continues to batter at our conscience. He tries to strip us of our faith in Christ. He attempt, attempts to destroy us. But take courage, because even if you haven't always resisted the devil as you should, there is a person who did. Jesus Christ resisted and overcame Satan on our behalf. He overcame every temptation of the devil presented to him. And the writer of the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus knows our every temptation. He knows how hard it is. He defeated the devil for us so that we could share in his eternal victory. He gave us life on that hill of Golgotha so that you and I could be redeemed forever. 
so that we are now God's holy children, bound for that everlasting glory in heaven. Our victory over Satan is one of God's intended consequences that has already been assured by Christ. So resist the devil. Flee from him. Resist the devil like Jesus did in the wilderness by using the powerful word of God. And when you feel the tug of temptation, you should immediately go to your Bible. And though the devil will seek to make that ever so difficult, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you feel your faith is weak, you should by any means possible come to the Lord's house. Hear that word. Take part in the sacraments. Get strength from your fellow Christians. Though the devil will give you a thousand reasons to skip church. Right, right, writing on this passage, Martin Luther said, you must be sober and vigilant in order that the body may be ready. But this does not yet vanquish the devil. It is done only in order that you may give the body less reason to sin. The true sword is your strong and firm faith. If you take hold of God's word in your heart and cling to it with faith, the devil cannot win but must flee. These are very encouraging words by someone who knew the meaning of temptation. Now the final part of Peter's message that may be the hardest for us today is endure suffering and God will establish you. Peter says in verse 10, But may the God of all graces, who calls us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's probably not exactly what we want to hear when we're going through suffering in our lives, is it? Imagine if you were sick and someone sent you a card. I hope you get better, not before you've suffered. Our prayer is always that the Lord re remove our suffering immediately, isn't it? But that's not always the best thing for us spiritually. And the Lord knows that. Don't act like something strange, Peter said earlier. This is intended consequences. This is what the Christian life is. It's challenges, it's trials, it's difficulties, and yes, even suffering. That's what Acts 14, 22 says. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Sometimes the Lord allows suffering in our lives to discipline us, to strengthen our faith, to draw us closer to Him. Bible says in Hebrews 12, 6, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and disciplines every son whom he receives. So Peter wants us to hang in there when suffering comes, endure it in patient hope, for this is another of God's intended consequences. After you have been disciplined by hard times, God promises to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this picture is a foundation of building firmly laid down and established that won't be shaken, but will endure forever. Though, of course, we won't have to endure. The Apostle Paul it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, For our light affliction, which is but a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things 
which are seen, but at the things that are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, our true life, our eternal life, is hidden in heaven with our Savior. The poet Robert Burns once said, Best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. We are frail humans, and our actions, well intended though they may be, often have unintended consequences, and our plans often fail. How comforting it is to know that God's plans never do. What a relief it is to realize that the big things in our lives, the really important things, can't go awry for the consequences that God wills for our lives are all intended and they're all for our good. Over the past months, I hope you've enjoyed God's word from Peter's first epistle. Peter wrote this epistle to, or letter to believers and to us today. He wants to remind us to remain steadfast in faith and to increase through all kinds of trials and sufferings and good works. He strengthens our faith through the divine promise and power of salvation that is to come, not merited by us, but through Jesus Christ our Savior. For Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He teaches us to know Christ as our head and our cornerstone. Like a true priest to sacrifice ourselves to God just as Christ sacrificed himself for us. And in this final chapter, Peter says, humble yourself. And God will exalt you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Endure the suffering that God will, and God will establish you. But perhaps the greatest intended consequences of them all lies in the simple words of Paul to the jailer at Philippi. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
We give thee but thy own, but ere the gift may be, all that we have is thine own. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Today we've been asked to have a prayer for Josh and Amanda Campbell's family as they face the loss of his father, and also for continued healing for our brother Steve. Father in heaven, as Josh and Amanda face the loss of his father, strengthen their faith. Give them the knowledge that it is only through your holy word and sacraments that they will receive true comfort in this time of loss. Bless them with an abiding faith in their Redeemer and Lord. Give to them comfort that you forgive all sin as they grieve his loss. We pray that as well that you would ever enable us to be ready, either to continue in this life or depart from it. To that end, pour out your Spirit on us abundantly, that we may ever remain your faithful servants. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great, great physician of body, mind, and soul. Even as your hand chastens us out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, you also give us patience to endure and strength to overcome. To continue to be with Steve, give healing through the hands of those who have called into the medical profession. You remind us that your undying love through your word, you bring comfort and peace to families, and they begin, as he begins, the time of health and healing. We ask you to continue his recovery according to your will. Help him to be joyful in your grace and grateful vessel of your goodness. Grant him patience that he might be a live according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who are worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in thy purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinance of thy house. And we did beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto the holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors shall preach thy word with power, and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly believe it. Send forth labors into thy harvest. Open the door of faith unto all the heathen, none of the people of Israel. In mercy remember the enemies of thy church, and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger, and may we be in communion with thy church in brotherly unity, all our fellow Christians fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially who entrust thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools, and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtue, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities, by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and Father of the widow and the father of his children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Except we beseech thee our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come. Doing the work thou hast given us to do while this day before night cometh, when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power. Receive us into thy everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth in thee and the Holy Ghost forever and ever. All this we pray in the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, number 410. Thank you. 